from there. So the plan is that we're going to do the weekly space hangout now. So does yeah, anybody know round anything about two? Today? Round two, that's right. So, so for for people who who maybe didn't catch it, we had a bit of a get yesterday, a bit of a catch, uh, which was that we had Bass Lansdorp, who is the CEO of um, of the Mars One project, and he agreed to join us on the Weekly Space Hangout yesterday and answer some of our questions. Oh, Nicole Gallucci is going to join us too. That's the hope. She wasn't in the green room, but. Uh... She's got some stories on the spreadsheet here. I've given her the link, so hopefully she, she'll she be able to join us. Right, so Bass Lanzarp joined us. Uh, we asked him some probing questions, asked him to predict the number of people who would die and uh, and how they would deal with that as people died, um, how, whether they would be willing, how, the, how they were going to maintain the project over the long term. Uh, it was a terrific uh, interview. He was great. Um, I just hope he didn't look at any of the previous uh, week's episodes of the Weekly Space Hangout where we talked about them. It's Nicole. Hi. Um, so yeah, so we uh, so anyways, we talked to Bass for for thirty minutes and it was fun. And he said he'll come back maybe when maybe when the first person is walking on the moon or it's on the Mars. We'll uh, we'll get we'll get him back on the show. Um, or maybe it, sooner than that. So. Uh, right. So anyway, so we're gonna do. So we, what? I, where I'm going with this is that we took all this time talking to us. So we didn't really get through a ton of stories, and we especially didn't get through all the stories for the weekly space hangout uh, crew. So there was a ton of big stories that happened over the week, and so we're going to just like literally go into part two of the weekly space hangout and just catch up on uh, on even more stories. So awesome. glad I missed part one. <laughs> glad you missed part one. Do you, would you have had? I know Friday afternoons are so bad for me. Come back, Fraser. Oh shoot! <laughs> okay, that was just me. Would you have had some time here? Am I having somebody some internet kicked the, problem? Somebody kicked, somebody kicked the internet in Canada. <laughs> Still. Uh, so while Fraser's fixing his connection, that's Macy, the dog I tweet about all the time. <laughs> Hi, Macy. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Long time to see. Yeah, it's been a long time. Great to see you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard, but earlier today I offered a piece of my body um, to be tattooed. I don't know what piece yet. <laughs> oh my! Uh, we so are reach, are you, we gonna, reach. you guys aren't able to see me. Hey, say that again, Fraser. So, can you guys hear me at all? Oh, we can't hear you. Ooh, that's a new feature. Uh, yes. Down my bandwidth. Did that work? Uh, You're a little bit better. Working. Try again, Fraser. I've turned down the bandwidth. Did that work at all? It's it's getting through now. It's it's still a little sketch, but it's coming through. You guys all look crystal clear to me. <laughs> wow. Somebody's uploading something in your house. No. Turn off Netflix. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, I've, I'm turning that off. No way. So Nicole, uh, are you gonna pick? Is this gonna be a NASA style? We're gonna give you any choice you want as long as it's one of our five. Uh, or how's this gonna happen? Are you taking open submissions for this uh, I, I design? Totally did not think this through. So <laughs> basically, as is true with most tattoos. As with actually, my first tattoo, my first and only tattoo so far, I had this design picked out for two years because I was 16 and couldn't get a tattoo. So it was it was well thought out that one. Um, I think I've been taking suggestions. Um, I pulled a few from the comments and from Twitter since since that all went down. Uh, and also I'll put those up because um, really I've I've. Wanted to get another one, but don't know exactly which astronomical phenomenon I want tattooed on me now. Um, 
uh, Phil Plate was suggesting some places I should get tattooed uh, that were horrible. Uh, things like the, the whites of my eyeballs. Um, any, basically any body part that sounded funny to him. Uh, some of them were internal. So <laughs> we're not letting Phil choose where I get a tattoo. Um, probably wise. What? So probably wise. Probably wise. So yeah, it'll be something astronomical. I'll put up a... If you have suggestions, tweet me at Noisy Astronomer. Um, and then I'm going to get a list of all the people who donated in that hour and make sure they all get a vote and then do it during our... Um, we'll probably you know open it during one of our le learning space hangouts and then close it during the next one. So that's the goal. Oh, that's and then exciting. get this done probably before I leave Edwardsville. <laughs> yeah, so when, are you, uh, okay. when do you move for your, uh, for your new fancy new job? I leave Edwardsville at the end of June. Oh, wow. Uh, I spend about a month floating around. I'll probably be staying with my mom in New York, and then I actually move up to New Hampshire in August uh, to start my job as a physics professor. That's exciting. Weird. <laughs> so That's what about awesome. now? That's heard, better. Can you guys hear me? Okay, hold yes. on. Let's see if we can boost this again. How about now? Is it all better? Okay, I'm going full. I'm pushing right back up at the top. How about now? We can still I, hear I, I, you. I'm You're down. really blocky, but we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you fine now. Hmm. I I turned off everything. I turned off Google Drive. I turned off everything. It's fine. So pick, we can hear you now. It's That's the important. meteorites. It's the meteorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you know what? Let's do a show. I really, you guys are such professionals. While I'm all pixelating, you guys are just like. Just transitioning smoothly We're vamping. to We're a, vamping. Uh, a very interesting conversation about, uh, I don't know, I couldn't hear. Astronomical um, tattoos. Astronomical tattoos. And the new one I'm going to get because we reached our goal in the learning space segment of this hangout a And would you be willing to do that for, for, for this session, Nicole? Get a, another, another one? one? <laughs> um, so, so have you decided what you're going to get? What are you going to get? No, the, the, I'm going to put up a few. I put up a few. I've been taking suggestions, and I'm going to have people vote. <laughs> That's awesome. It's a good thing that uh, Stephen Colbert is off the air. Oh my god! <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I just have a blank option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you vote, then it's going to be the Stephen. Co it's going to be a picture of Stephen Colbert on your. On your well, anyway, in your arm. It's not. <laughs> um, that was me trying to be polite. Okay. Anyway, let's talk about space. Let's I think you should dye your beard a fun color. <laughs> mm. Or shave it. Actually, my girlfriend would kill me. I'm like literally not allowed to shave off my beard. Ooh, okay. Ooh. She's seen some pictures of pre Fraser beard. Doesn't like it. So. <laughs> Um, although we, we did, we did, man, we're never going to get to the show. We did uh, an episode of our Guide to Space, and we did a Mirror Universe episode, and so I was really tempted to, like, wear a sash and shave off my beard or shave a goatee and have it going <gasps> back and yeah. forth as we did the episode. That would have been fun. That would be fun. Uh, um, okay, cool. So let's, you know what I think we should talk about do? I'm going to remind everybody who's watching that this is a live show, um, and we are trying to raise money for the CosmoQuest Hangout-a-thon for the CosmoQuest Foundation, as Pamela has been so eloquently saying just now. Um, really, CosmoQuest exists. The, all the education that we do comes just thanks. We totally depend on, on the kind donations from all of you folks. And so if you love of science happening, astronomy education, outreach happening, then we really, really, really appreciate everything you do, and we really depend on you. And so to sweeten the pot, I've re reached into my personal archive over the next six hours as I host the Hangout-a-thon. I will be handing out one of my each hour. So... Oh, is it, is it choppy again? <laughs> <laughs> I think we got the point. Piece of space rock from, for thank yous. Donate money to <laughs> science, get rock from space. It's a pretty yeah. simple now, equation here. Once an hour. I, I give up. 
You get up one and out. Yeah, I'm clearly got bad internets. So we're gonna think someone snuck in on the on the last hour, and uh, and now we'll do, and so we'll look at the end of this, and we'll pick at random, and we'll and we'll send some out. And you have to tell me what your superpower is that you get from it. All right. I um, you know what superpower I got. Morgan, let's talk about to uh, talk about the story that you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So let's uh, start with uh, a new story for the for the week. And I, 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 I my superpower is uh, having clear audio right now. Um, and I think I will go with the story about uh, NASA and the contracts for the International Space Station. Uh, we all know that for the last couple of years. Uh, private companies have been delivering the cargo to the International Space Station ever since the um, uh, space shuttle was discontinued here in the U.S. The only way that uh, NASA has to get equipment directly to the ISS is uh, through private companies. That's uh, SpaceX uh, and Orbital Sciences. Of course, we can send things uh, up with the Europeans on their progress unmanned uh, capsules as well, but we'd like to have our own capabilities for doing this, and right now uh, SpaceX um, with the Dragon and Orbital Science with the Cygnus are delivering those um, those cargo to the space station. Uh, and those contracts were finite, however. NASA allotted a certain amount of cargo to be delivered by SpaceX, a certain amount of cargo to be delivered by Orbital, uh, and although they've extended those contracts once, they're due to run out uh, sometime probably in 2017. And, of course, the space station is going to continue not through 2017, but through 2024. And so they needed uh, to reaffirm uh, how they'll be getting this cargo to the space station. And originally, they were supposed to make these selections uh, this month in April. Uh, but back in December, they pushed that back to June. Uh, and we just found out that they pushed it back from June all the way to September. Uh, and they're doing this because they say that they have uh, a lot of contracts to, or a lot of proposals to evaluate. Uh, no fewer than five companies have publicly claimed to have entered this competition. Uh, in addition to SpaceX and Orbital, which uh, one must presume have a bit of a leg up for having already uh, been operating, uh, we have uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, and Sierra Nevada have all put forth proposals to also uh, deliver this con uh, this cargo to the space station. Uh, and so given sort of the hot water that NASA and the Air Force have been in uh, over the last sort of 12 months about how they make the selections of which rockets to fly and which companies uh, to work with, uh, they've wanted to make sure that they take the full time necessary to pick the right contracts on the right merits uh, and try to avoid any of the, the difficulties that they've had uh, in the past with, with bias or anything like that. Uh, so. Fortunately, you know, we're not delivering these these contracts until 2017 or 2018, so the idea that we have to wait till September is not that big a deal uh, in the long run. Am I going to have to just say every time, can you guys hear me? Yes, and we can hear you there. Um, now we can't. How about now? Increase my bandwidth a little bit. Now you can't. Okay, so it looks like Wait, it's standing catch up. low. Yeah, low are having the same <laughs> even low issues. Or <laughs> There's just low. sounds coming out. Super pixelated. <laughs> I'm going to try refreshing my browser. You're good. You're good. You're working. No, I'm, going to, I'm going to refresh my browser. Okay, fine. Woo. All right. Now he's gone, so we can... Now who's in control? Uh, we run the... Uh, uh, run no, the... No, 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 no. <laughs> Do we... Uh, are we running the prison now? <laughs> oh, goodness. So I have not been on the Weekly Space Hangout for quite some time, uh -huh. uh, so I need to be refreshed as to how this... There's like a huge list of stories you guys have s had submitted to you. Yeah, so maybe since you uh, were last on, the, the latest development is that we now have a crew of superheroes uh, that basically does our work for us uh, called the Weekly Space Hangout crew, and they, uh -huh. every week, 
assemble all of the cool space stories uh, in a list. And if you're lazy like I am, then you wait till Friday morning and you pick stories off of that list and copy and paste them to the top, put your name by them, and then you talk about them. Uh, and then at the end, we try to wrap up by doing quick you know, one-liners about uh, the remaining stories. Uh, so yeah, they really are, are our heroes, and they're the ones that have been lining up the awesome guests that we get as well. Uh, people like Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian, or Bass Slamsdorp, the uh, CEO of Mars One. And we got some more exciting guests coming up in, in the coming weeks. Amy Shira And they've been uh, very instrument and they've been very instrumental in helping out tonight too. So that's awesome. Yeah, they're manning the green room for us tonight. I know. I was there earlier today. That was like the party room. <laughs> can they help with my internet? <laughs> Don't know if they can bring more tubes to you that quickly. But it's working now. It Better. Is. Yep. It's very fast. I just ran a speed test. It's running very quickly. There's, it's got to be something with Google. I'm just going to blame Google. Sorry, Google. This one's on you. Sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Okay, so hold on. Let me just see if I increase the bandwidth again. Oh, my God. It... Why did you just leave it? It's working. <laughs> <laughs> How about now? It's great now. All right. Great. Maybe refreshing the browser worked. But, the, but here's the part that's crazy, is that you guys are all perfectly clear, and so I can't see when I'm glitching. That's, that's the part that... makes it even funnier. That's, yeah, yeah, right, for you. Um, all right. I love you, Fraser. Well, that was really interesting, Morgan. Uh, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to drink more or less. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe change what you're drinking. I've, yeah, I was going to say, I've had water. That's not helping. Oh, my God, it's water. Mm. Let's talk about Alma. Alma, sure. Which was uh, one of the suggestions that I should get tattooed on me. Uh, is <laughs> Alma, which is uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. And there was a cool uh, story. It came out actually a couple weeks ago. Since I haven't been on the Weekly Space Hangout, everything's new to me. Um, <laughs> This is um, real. Okay, I'm partly think this is really cool because this relates back to the very first research project I ever did when I was an undergrad. Um, this group of researchers used Alma, this radio array in the Atacama Desert, to look at the study the magnetic fields around a supermassive black hole. Now, the way that you do that, not very easy as you can imagine. Um, supermassive black holes, um, these particularly active ones, have jets of, of charged particles streaming away from them near the speed of light. Those jets give off emission that we could see in the radio. Now, if you uh, use a, um, if you're looking at shorter and shorter wavelengths, you can actually look closer and closer in to where the black hole like that is powering that jet is. So there's been a lot of work um, pushing to higher and higher frequencies to get closer and closer and closer to that black hole engine. ALMA is, is the, the radio telescope out there that uh, is looking at some of the shortest wavelengths out there. Um, and they were specifically looking at the polarization of the light coming from these jets really close into the black hole. Um, the polarization tells you something about the magnetic field. There's this thing called this effect called Faraday rotation. So as a polar as polarized light goes through a magnetic field, it's actually turned, and the polarization is rotated as it moves through that magnetic field. Now the rotation of the polarization depends on the wavelength of the light. So if you sample different wavelengths, you can actually figure out, oh, there's this curve here, and I figured out the strength of the magnetic field. Um, so the very first project I ever did with a radio telescope was using the Very Long Baseline Array to do this um, three millimeter wavelengths, which are some of the longest ones for ALMA. Those are really short ones for those telescopes. Um, and looking at polarization. I, I was this undergrad who like had never even seen a command line before. I mean, since at least since the Apple IIs. And I didn't know what I was doing, and they threw this data at me, this polarization, black holes. And, um, and over the course of two months, I probably did what, you know, one of these guys could do in a week, um, making this map of the polarization near black hole. They've gotten in a lot closer, a lot higher fidelity than we did back 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, so they're really honing in on the black hole engine um, of, this, of this. You've got uh, a picture? Uh, well, it's radio astronomy, right? So there are blobs. 
I could. <laughs> You've got a, a, some kind of blobs that we can try and interpret. Uh, we've got an artist conception. Hang on a sec. Let me maneuver my windows. Uh, screen share. Screen share. Screen share. Oh, that's the whole screen. You didn't want to see that. Um, but that is the artist's conception of a supermassive black hole surrounded by an accretion disk, surrounded by a torus. Oh, here we go, torus. And then it's showing um, the magnetic field lines and the jet uh, giving off synchrotron emission um, from that. Um, but what's actually in the paper, let me see if I can pull up the paper. This was in Science a um, couple weeks back, so they have some slightly nicer images. Uh, the actual images, let's do the screen share again. My dog is barking in her sleep now. Aww. That's <laughs> snorry. Okay, so here's from the actual paper. Uh, please don't sue me. Uh, these are the, um, this is the, this is the blobs that you get. These are literally That's it. Big blobs. Astronomy is going to do a takedown request. <laughs> big Astronomy is going to take us down. Sorry. The journal's going to take us down. These are the big blobs that you see. I think blobs are pretty, but that's me. These are actually the polarized um, There's so signal. much science in there. So much science in the blobs! Um, and then they end up uh, fitting it to um, a rotation measure, which gives you the magnetic field of about, I think they got about 10 gauss for this magnetic field, which I totally can't even put into real, you know, like what that is like for your kitchen magnet. Anybody know what <laughs> typical fridge magnets are in gauss? Please, please. Please correct me. Oh, but, but we can type it into Wolfram Alpha and find out. Go for it. And while you do that, I'll show you this. This is what, one of their illustrations of the disk around the black hole. This is the jet that you're looking at. So the jet, we're looking almost straight down the barrel of the jet. And as you go to higher and higher frequencies, you're seeing regions closer and closer to the black hole. So that's what's really exciting um, that ALMA can do at its um, super short wavelengths. Awesome, and uh, Chloe oh, yeah. has joined me for this segment. Hi! Ten gauss um, is like half of an MRI. Okay, so that's actually not like as extreme as you think a supermassive black hole would have around it, but that's the measurements that they're getting. That's lame. <laughs> Super lame black well, hole. But yet, that is what's making oh, this Logan jet. Oh, Logan to join us too. That is what's making that jet. Here we go. Up of uh, particles that's oh. moving at near the speed of light. Hello! Do you want us to get the Carla too? No. No, it's good. Logan, you can't hear them, so nope. you're going to have to assume they're saying, uh, uh, well, that's awesome. Again. So, Rock Nancy. Up, Alma. Alma got you. All that jazz. Oh my got you. Oh my god. Nancy, let's talk about Apollo 13. I've been that meme stick for so long. <laughs> All right, we want to talk about Apollo 13. Yeah, that's been my life for the past uh, two and a half weeks. I've been living in 1970 again. Right. It's been pretty great. So uh, the story of um, of what I've been working on is uh, a series called 13 More Things That Saved Apollo 13. Five years ago, I uh, did a whole series with NASA engineer Jerry Woodfill, and uh, he had come up with 13 things that saved Apollo 13, and then uh, he contacted me uh, about a year ago and said, hey, I've come up with 13 more, so uh, we, we're doing our second series. But Jerry is just a really amazing guy. He was uh, actually at, or he is still at NASA, but he was... Um, working on the caution and warning system. He helped develop that uh, and he was monitoring it that night of uh, uh, April 13th, 1970 when the explosion happened on Apollo 13. So, uh, and he has just been fascinated by the whole turn of events and uh, just how things worked out and uh, all that. So he's kind of researched kind of behind the scenes of uh, what happened and uh, all that. So he's come up with all these great things. So um, uh, I'll just go through a few things that he's come up here with the uh, the 13 more things, the second our second series here. Uh, one of them was the, the failed oxygen quantity sensor. And that was actually, uh, it was uh, 
measuring the 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 pressure or the amount of oxygen that was in the the tank that exploded and that sensor was was not reading correctly and that's the reason why they kept stirring the tanks uh, extra and not actually you know the uh, so the the oxygen quantity sensor wasn't what failed but that was that was what was not working correctly and why they uh, why they had to keep stirring the tanks that kind of thing so it was kind of uh, and one of the big things about the explosion in Apollo 13 is is the timing and when it happened, and that is so important because if it would have happened earlier, like say uh, right after they left Earth orbit, um, it, they would not have had enough consumables to make it or um, do their free return tra trajectory around the moon and, and get back. And if it would have happened later, say if uh, when Lovell and Hayes were on the moon and it happened when uh, Swigert was in orbit all by himself. Uh, they would have been stranded on the moon. So uh, uh, the timing was really crucial. And so having them do all those extra tank stirs uh, really was crucial as far as when it happened. Um, some of the other things, let's see. Detuning the Saturn V's third stage radio. So they had... Uh, uh, a new experiment for Apollo 13, and that was that the the uh, the third stage of the Saturn V was going to crash into the moon, and they were going to measure that the the vibrations uh, because uh, Apollo 12 and 11 had left uh, sensors on the moon to to look for moonquakes, and so uh, anyway, so it had a radio signal on it. And unfortunately, it had the exact same radio frequency as the the lunar lander. And normally, and during a normal mission, that would not have been a problem because, uh, you know, the by the time the third stage would have crashed into the moon, then you would have turned the lander on after that. So, um, but with Apollo 13 and the problem, so we had these two radio frequencies, and they were causing a lot of problems. And uh, I came across a really great website put together by the people at Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station in Australia. And uh, there's a really uh, wonderful uh, um, r account of this and how they really kind of figured out and, and solved the problem. So that was pretty cool. And uh, another one is uh, the mysterious longer than expected communications blackout at reentry. And it's kind of interesting that nobody has really said definitively why they had the the 87 second longer blackout period if you've ever watched the movie Apollo 13 it's just that climax at the end of when you you know of course we know that they didn't make it back but it's they did a really good job on the, in the movie of capturing the tension of uh, you know not knowing if if the guys survived the reentry or not so um, the uh, so you'll have to read the article about uh, you know what what the different uh, thoughts are as to why the blackout w um, was longer, but it's it's pretty interesting stuff. And again, uh, the Honey Creek, Honeysuckle Creek uh, historian, his name is Colin McKellar, has put together a great website, and they have a audio recording from the uh, Area Four aircraft that actually was the first to. Uh, make contact with Apollo 13, and it's it's a really awesome recording. So, and it's you can't find it anywhere else but uh, on uh, the Honeysuckle Creek website. But we do have a link to it in our articles. And uh, so, right now, uh, we've got uh, nine articles done so far out of 13, and I'll be doing more next week. And then we're going to have a quiz at the end. So, yeah, there is a quiz. So, hope you enjoy the article. So it's been really fun. Yeah. So this is the, the second, second set, set that you did, right? The first set was the 13 things that saved Apollo 13, and yep. but you actually had so many that you were able to do a whole second series. Yep. Yeah, he came up with uh, with 13 more, so it's pretty great. That's awesome. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. He's he's just an awesome guy. He's been with NASA for uh, this later this year. He will have been there for 50 years. Well. Nicole, you were uh, you put a pile of stories into this list. This is great. 
let's let's talk about the fact that there's no uh, space aliens. Yeah, so I noticed, I saw the blank sheet for this for this episode, was like, I should put stories in! Oh no, it's blank! And then I realized you had that, like, huge backlog of stories from everybody else that I completely missed. But this was one that was actually sent in by the Weekly Space Hangout crew, too, so, huh, what do you think alike? Uh, yeah, this was an interesting story, because it's it's got a rather provocative headline of certain civilizations beyond Earth finds nothing in 100,000 galaxies. What? So I um, I occasionally teach a Life Beyond Earth course, which uh, I, I love very much. And one of the things we talk about is the fact that um, we have been searching for you know signals of extraterrestrial life, um, and that the radio telescopes that we use and even uh, the optical study programs that we use can only see so far into our own galaxy. So we've really only probed a small part of our galaxy. Um, from a, a radio SETI perspective. Uh, but this is saying they've searched 100,000 galaxies and find no aliens. What are they talking about? Well, what they were looking at, what they were looking for Dyson spheres. So this is the uh, idea that a, an advanced civilization um, could be picked up by its infrared emission, meaning that it would be, <clears throat> they would have built uh, some kind of sphere or a ring or some other apparatus. Nope. Nope. Sorry, my computer. <laughs> Some kind of apparatus um, that would uh, collect the energy from that civilization's sun and redirect it towards useful purposes like you know, building spaceships or building cities and you know powering life and having a lovely time on their planet. Um, what that would do is the outside of that shell would give off a specific uh, infrared signature because it would be blocking the in the, the visible light um, but still giving off heat with a certain mid-infrared signature. So they used um, WISE, which is a space telescope uh, specifically used in the infrared, to do a survey, which they called GHAT, Glimpsing Heat from Alien Technologies Survey. They put out uh, a paper in Astrophysical Journal. It's 43 pages. I did not get a chance to read it. Uh, it's in the Astrophysical Journal supplement. Um, and it's also a copy of it on archive as well. So that means it's, there's a, a preprint copy that is freely available for anyone to look at. Um, <clears throat> So looking specifically for those types of civilizations, they did a survey in the mid-infrared of these 100,000 galaxies and did not find any infrared sources um, that fit this, this model of what a Dyson sphere would be given off. So um, this is not saying there are no aliens in these 100,000 galaxies, but there doesn't seem to be any Dyson spheres according to this survey, which is frankly a little disappointing. I'd love to see some, you know, extraterrestrial ETs possibilities in my lifetime. Uh, but what they did find, uh, they did find a couple of uh, some anomalies, um, some interesting um, dust clouds around stars that have never been seen before, um, some other um, astrophysical sources that are interesting for follow-up for astrophysics, although nothing that would really uh, raise a flag for the SETI folks. So that's one type of search for extraterrestrial intelligence that uh, at least hasn't quite come up with um, with, with, uh, with a, a, a particular, sorry, I, I want to make a correction here. I'm looking at the um, the uh, the abstract. They were specifically looking for uh, super civilizations that were galaxy spanning. So that's the yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm about to go into a great big long explainer rant, but only if the internet is stable. Okay, go for it. Okay, cool. So yeah, so what they were looking for was a Kardashev three, right. Kardashev type three civilization, right? This is step one is where a civilization has gathered all the energy for their from their planet. Step two is they're gathering all the energy from their star, and step three is they're gathering all the energy from their entire galaxy. And so you know, the Dyson sphere is what you get when you gather all that energy from your star. You you know you surround your star, and you can trap the. Um, you can collect a lot of the radiation that's coming from the star, but a lot of it will still bleed out in infrared. And so in theory, a Dyson sphere has a very specific signature, a very specific heat signature that can be seen in space. But the, the Type 3 civilization, not only have they gone and taken the one star, they've gathered them all up into Dyson spheres. Right. So every right. single star in their entire galaxy has been put into a Dyson sphere and the whole galaxy gives off a very specific infrared signature 
that would then be picked up by WISE. And that sounds crazy, right? It sounds insane that, that, that that's, but, but yet, you know, if you can, you know, we've talked about this, about the Fermi paradox, right, that, <clears throat> that a, civil, a su sufficiently technological civilization should be able to explore its entire galaxy in a million years, in 10 million years, if it's feeling really patient, 100 million years, and that when you look out, all you need the, you know, the, the, I always say it's like a sandwich, right? It doesn't matter where the mold starts. <laughs> Give it a week. We're going with that. <laughs> the whole sandwich will be mold. So it doesn't matter where the alien civilization starts in your galaxy. Give it 10 million years. Give it 100 million years, and it will have colonized the entire galaxy. And it will then, in theory, turn every single one of its stars into a Dyson sphere. So, that, that, I mean, this seems like it relies on a really specific prediction uh, of, you know, some mid-20th century human dude uh, thinking, ah, this must be the ideal way of uh, collecting, again, of collecting power out of your... Um, your stars, and you know, maybe once you've spanned your galaxy, you've figured out a much better way to collect power from the stars than building giant balls around all of the stars, which seems awfully inefficient to me. Yeah. So I have a question. So is is there any other technology that would be uh, visible in mid infrared range that people could detect? That Wise could detect. Well, I think the, the thing I the thing I, I missed in in first talking about this is the. It has to be whatever it is. It has to be big enough to scan the whole galaxy to show up in this survey, right? Oh, okay. So yeah, it just has to be big enough to scan the whole galaxy. You could have, I guess, uh, I don't know with this signature, but I mean, you could have like an interstellar highway, but uh, I don't know. You need a galaxy that is the whole thing is giving off infrared in a particular way. Right. Oh. That's just the key. Yeah. Right. It's worth noting too that you know a hundred thousand galaxies is a tiny the, sample. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you guys Go laughing ahead, at a huge delay for me? A <laughs> hundred thousand galaxies is a, is a tiny sample of galaxies out there in the universe. You know, uh, observations today suggest there's probably at least two hundred billion galaxies. Uh, out there just in the observable part of the universe. And so 100,000 is, you know, is a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of all those galaxies. Uh, so even, the, it, it, it tells us that maybe right around us this isn't happening, at least not in this specific the way. It's still big. I mean, if I want to find ET, I want to find ET within communicating distance. Uh, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, but we're talking about, you know, this is like, you know, less than a tenth of a percent. Uh, of all of the galaxies in the in the just in part of the visible part of the universe. What would we do if they did, right? If they did see tens of galaxies out there, with that we could see were clearly run by alien empires. Exactly. I don't know. What do you do? You first of all, they're megaparsecs away. They're millions of light years away. Uh, so you don't even know if they're still there. It's been millions of years. There's just no conceivable way to communicate unless, you know, they figured out wormhole technology and, you know, are stargating They're over They're sending Matthew McConaughey yeah. back to us right now. <laughs> I still haven't seen that movie. <laughs> That's so terrible. <laughs> All right. Well, so I think... I think it was great. I think it was a great idea. I think super elegant. I'm... Uh, I, it was worth looking for. Yeah. The wise... The WISE mission has really gone, extended its lifetime and studied everything from these, you know, Dyson gal looked for Dyson galaxies and also uh, characterizing the near-Earth asteroid population in our solar system. So it's got, it's got a lot of good science out of it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. You got another one, Nicole, so let's just keep going. Okay. You're talking about the virtual telesp telescope. Roll, rolling with it. So this is another radio astronomy story, big surprise. <laughs> um, the uh, this is a virtual telescope expands to see black holes. Now they say virtual telescope as a way of, I guess, saying interferometer without saying the scary science work. Um, so interferometers are these, you know, telescopes that are all linked together to work as one telescope. All these individual dishes that all work as one radio telescope. They're great because you can't make 
he, you can only make radio telescopes so big. Um, the one in Arecibo is, of course, the biggest single dish telescope, and that's supported by the valley underneath it. Um, the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia is the largest single, largest fully steerable single dish telescope. Um, <clears throat> if you want to get much bigger than that, we do, because our wavelengths are so long, you need big telescopes to get any useful resolution, um, you start building dishes and, and, and connecting them up and using some 4A math to bring it all together. Um, I just made that sound really simple. Um, so the very large array, that iconic Y-shaped array in the desert in New Mexico is one example. Alma in Chile is another. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> the um, black hole, look, I, well they're calling it, the, I think it's still called the black hole, uh, sorry, Event Horizon Telescope. It's combining some radio telescopes from all these different arrays actually. It's, it's combining a bunch of different telescopes. Some uh, we've one at least one in uh, in uh, the Atacama Desert. There's Apex. <clears throat> there are several. Uh, I think there's one in Mexico. There are. Um, I think they use some of the dishes from um, from uh, the the American Southwest as well. They've been putting together these telescopes um, into this array. It's kind of a hodgepodge because all these. D telescopes are different, which makes it a little bit harder to deal with. Um, and they're using them at a specific frequency, again, a specific wavelength, uh, millimeter wavelengths, um, in order to study a black hole that's very near and dear to all of us. It's the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, also known as Sagittarius A star. Um, <clears throat> it is the black hole that we have the best chance of imaging exactly what it looks like right around the event horizon um, because of its size and because of its proximity to us. Even though it's a pretty quiet, boring, supermassive black hole as far as they go, um, it's, it's, the, it's the closest and it's the one we'll be able to resolve the best. And so they're connecting these telescopes from all over the world to do this. Uh, again, this, this ties back to my first internship when I was a baby undergrad. They were working on it then uh, and they've improved their technology significantly since then. Um, so they've added uh, some much longer baselines. Oh yeah, there's telescopes in Hawaii as well. They've added the South Pole Telescope um, to the mix and so there's actually one more telescope that's being brought in that's actually um, giving it a long baseline. The Nicole, how does this work oh. since these are on like different sides of the world? They can't all be pointing at the same thing at the same time, can they? Um, yeah, so they, yeah, so it'll, those, your source might be setting for some telescopes while it's rising for others, so you do have uh, periods of time where you can't get the whole array, and I ran into this with the very long baseline array, which stretches across North America. Um, you can only, you know, you, you don't get Hawaii and St. Croix in, in the Caribbean at the same, you know, necessarily at the same time, but you're integrating over eight hours, you're adding all that data together, um, and so that uh, added all together makes your image. So yeah, so they're not showing, in fact, I'm going to try and screen share this map of the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, so here's the new South Pole Telescope, which is joined along with uh, the Atacama Pathfinder Experiment, which is Apex in Chile, Mexico. We've got uh, some telescopes in, in the southwestern U.S. and then over in Hawaii. So all these telescopes, all of these long baselines are now going to be looking at um, the black hole. Uh, Sagittarius A star. Last time I saw a really cool model out of this, um, since they only had a few baselines, they couldn't do an image, but they could do a model of it. Um, <clears throat> they were getting some some pretty interesting results, and they could actually uh, test some, you know, sh you know, test relativity under strong gravity conditions by looking at what, you know, everything looks like around that event horizon as as it's being gravitationally lensed. So uh, the more telescopes they add, the more sensitive they are. The longer baselines mean uh, better resolutions, so you can see smaller details, um, and yeah, they're, they're going to keep working to actually get better and better images. If you add more telescopes, your models are better and it gets closer to an actual image of what it's like around a black hole. But it's a black hole, so you can't see you can't details see on the it. black hole. I was very, I'm trying to be very careful to say, see the stuff around it. <laughs> the immediate right. environment. The, black hole. The, the environment around you can watch it as it snacks from time to time. Yes, yes, which it doesn't do all that often because ours is really quiet and sad. Mm. And watch the stars zipping around it. Yes, the stars zipping around it as well. Those are quite a bit further out. Um, they're looking at really, really close. 
so yeah, kudos to kudos to the Event Horizon Telescope for still doing awesome stuff and adding self pull. Well, since my internet is so bad, I think um, Nicole, you should uh, tell everyone how they can donate and get them involved in uh, participating with the uh, Hangoutathon. Sure thing. So if you go to CosmoQuest.org right now, the video for the Hangoutathon and the link for the Hangoutathon is right up on the front where you can donate. And I can pull up where we are in donations so far. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. $12,148.44. No, We're behind. Wait. Pamela's yeah, going to kill us. We don't have donations this hour, and so your odds yeah. of getting a meteorite are pretty high right now. Uh, pretty this would be the time high. to jump in. So if you want to donate, you're in the running to win a space rock. And my superpower that I got when Fraser gave me a meteorite was that I always had a meteorite in my purse for, for emergency outreach situations. It's a really great superpower to have. So Sandy pulled that on me a couple of weeks ago. Just ran it over her purse. Bam. Me Chelly Ben's meteorite. Yeah, yeah, that's where I keep mine. <laughs> in my purse yeah, in the little pocket. No, no one ever sends me meteorites. I know. Sorry. Wait, Fraser, send him a I only right. have to meet in person, Morgan. <laughs> All right. I promise oh. you that when we meet in person, I will, uh, I will have a so meeting. I will bring a purse. Keep sharing. Keep donating. I know the late night, early morning hours in the U.S. are kind of tough. Uh, so, uh, yeah, get your friends watching. Or, or if you're in a part of the planet where it's not so ridiculously late, get your friends watching. Uh, in addition to donating, there are some progress bars for images. So uh, we're trying to get you guys to map images on the Moon, Mercury, Asteroid, and Mars mappers has launched. Um, and yeah, guys, come on. There's like 1,000 you've done out of 9,000. You can do better. I know you can. Um, my personal favorite, of course, is always Mercury, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> I've seen the moons being left in the dust. But yeah, you can totally check out CosmoQuest.org. Uh, donate to the Hangout-a-thon. Donate to keep science and science education programs running. And if you're out of cash, share the link and then go mark some craters and actually help do a little bit of science. Yeah, I'm looking at the donations right now, and I can see a bunch of people donated uh, just at the end of the last hour, and a bunch of people have donated this hour so, so far as well. So um, I am, I'm, I'm definitely going to be in for sending someone a meteorite each hour, every hour on the hour. Facebook. Hey, on so Friday, did you guys talk about the uh, transparent aluminum story? No. What? That was a link in the weekly Space Hangout crew thing. So that the Navy has made transparent aluminum, maybe? Do tell. Really? Okay, That's cool. so so they it's not it's not really transparent right aluminum. Now, so I yeah. Okay. So what it is, it's a uh, I'm just looking at the press release now. It's called Spinel, and it's a, it's actually a, a ceramic, a kind of a synthetic ceramic, and uh, they can make giant sheets of it. It's transparent. It's lightweight. It's bulletproof, and uh, it could be, you know, you could put whales in there. Uh huh. No. You can, you so they transport whales into the future. Into the future, yes. And uh, they say that uh, with bulletproof windows like today, um, you know, that has several layers of plastic and glass, it's probably to be extremely, you know, to do a good job, it's got to be about five inches thick. If you replaced it with this spinel, you'd reduce the weight by a factor of two or more. Wow. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not really transparent aluminum, but, you know, it's the next best thing. Um, Morgan, have you been following what's been going on with Ceres at all, with Dawn and the the bright white spot? Have you seen that uh, NASA is wanting people to actually vote on whether they think it's cryovolcanism no, or have, ice spots? I haven't yeah. seen the uh, the vote. Um, uh, there's, I mean, Dawn is sort of slowly circling in on Ceres, and so every few days it seems like we're getting a better picture uh, than we've had before, uh, but we still got a ways to go, I think, before we have sufficient resolution to really discern uh, exactly what, what we're looking at on the surface. Um, 
I think one of the interesting things that we had, uh, actually, I think in the rundown a couple of weeks ago and didn't get to, was the fact that it seems like some of the different white spots on the surface of Ceres have different thermal properties. Uh, so some are much colder than the background asteroid uh, itself, and others actually pretty much exactly match uh, the background. And it tells us that not every spot we see that looks the same uh, in pictures so far is actually going to turn out to be the same thing. Uh, in the end, because if, if it was the case, then you'd expect them all to have the same temperature uh, relative to um, the background asteroid itself. And so what, what we thought maybe was just one mystery initially uh, could split off to be a number of mysteries uh, for us to have to solve uh, as we get closer and closer. Uh, one picture I did want to share wow. uh, was a follow-up on uh, the story we did yesterday about the uh, jet coming off of Comet 67P as seen by Rosetta, uh, because this picture is just really amazing. So let's see if I can uh, be the latest While person. While you're looking for that, um, I don't know if I, I, I said, I briefly said this on Twitter, but when uh, a little while ago we were getting closer to the bright spots on Ceres, I shared uh, what I really, really hope they turn out to be, uh, because this would make me furiously happy if, if we you know got up close and actually saw that. <laughs> And what what was it? <laughs> it was a I was screen sharing it. Oh, sorry. What I'm is also it? Screen sharing. We, we apologize, apologize for the inconvenience. <sighs> it's God's final message to His creation from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right. And a lovely, lovely illustration of it that I found uh, on on Tumblr from this fellow here. So <laughs> that joke fell flat. I'm gonna eat myself now. <laughs> we're just we're just not quite there with our sci-fi references. We should be. All right, so Morgan, what do you got? Yeah, so what we're looking at here uh, is a pair of images taken by the Rosetta spacecraft of Comet 67P, uh, Churi, Yumov, Garish, Minko. Uh, and on the one on the left was taken, uh, and then the one on the right was taken uh, just two minutes later. And what I want to draw your attention to is kind of the butt of the duck here. So we're looking at the duck from behind. Uh, and on the left, if you notice this area, you see it's pretty much black. Uh, and two minutes later, another image was taken. You see this long jet shooting out the back of the comet. And this jet's actually uh, nearly a kilometer in length. And because we see the jet in one image and don't see it in the other, we know that it must have started and reached its current state sometime within that two-minute uh, gap uh, between the images. And this lets us put uh, some limits on the speed with which these particles must be shooting off of the surface of the moon, or I'm sorry, of a planet. Uh, and their best guess right now is that it's about eight meters per second, uh, which is, is, is not slow. Um, you know, for reference, I think about the fastest uh, human 100 meter dash times are something like uh, 10 meters per second. So we're talking about uh, really moving quickly off of the surface. Uh, and having a constraint like that on uh, the velocity that particles are leaving the comet like this will really help us understand and narrow down what mechanisms might be causing uh, this outgassing. Uh, because some things like, for example, sublimation or evaporation off the surface might just happen too slowly to create uh, a plume like this in under two minutes. So we might have to be looking at some something more explosive on the surface that's actually propelling out uh, these dust and gas particles fast enough to create uh, what we see in this really lucky pair of images. I'm sorry, you lost me like explosive duck farts. <laughs> <laughs> Which you didn't even say, but it was implied. <laughs> From the bottom part of the duck. I tried to be circumspect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep it professional. Well, we're sort of reaching the end of this uh, late night weekly space hangout. I, I think we should stick with our normal time. I can't make that time. I think this is... A, Maybe that's for the best. This is a one-off. Yeah. <laughs> the internet is battling against us, and clearly we have either had not enough to drink or too much. <sighs> Definitely not enough. 
Yeah. Um, and apparently there's all kinds of internet problems, so it's not just me. A lot of people are, are mentioning they're having problems with their internet, especially you folks in the uh, St. Louis, Ed Edwardsville area. So we're reaching, we're closing in on uh, seven minutes to go before this uh, hour is, is up. Um, donations, I'm seeing... Uh, well, there's a few more. We've got a, uh, I'm not, we've got about maybe ten people who've come in this hour, so your chances are one in ten. Um, but uh, I think I like your odds. So if you were thinking that you might want to donate to CosmoQuest, go to CosmoQuest.org/hangoutathon. There's a link to the donation, and uh, you can be in the running for one of Fraser's meteorite collection. Does that come with like a science certificate or anything to go with it? Of authenticity? No. No. No, I will. I will write you a letter and say thank you so much. Where Where did that come from again? You told me, and I forgot. Yeah, they come from they come from Argentina, from the Campos del Cielo uh, meteorite strike that happened back in uh, about five thousand years ago, and a big metal iron meteorite exploded in the sky and just rained down debris all across uh, a big ch swath of Argentina, and people are still finding them. If you go to any um, big museum and you see a meteorite there, it's a metal meteorite, it's going to be from that because they're, you know, they're some of the most spectacular big chunks of, of metal meteorite are, are from there. I mean, the thing is, like, you've got stone meteorites all around you, mm -hmm. but you don't know where they are because they look like rocks, yeah, right? While the, uh, the nickel iron ones, they're really clearly a piece of metal from space, so... Well, hey guys, uh, <clears throat> that was super duper. Thanks a lot. We should try and uh, we're going to try and get Hannah. Um, I guess Hannah is coming up next. She's going to be talking about uh, meteorites and uh, and asteroids. So, um, but but before you guys leave me alone, um, where can people find out more about what you do? Let's start with you, Nancy. Uh, I'm at Universe today. I'm. Uh, you can find me at Nancy underscore A on Twitter. And I'm on Facebook and Google Plus every once in a while. Twitter's the best one. Yes, definitely. And Nicole, where do people find out more? you got to be honest, I haven't been online much at all the last, I don't know, what, six months? <laughs> Still on Twitter as Noisy Astronomer. I'm there occasionally tweeting pictures of my dog. Um, working on a lot of local projects here, so I've been focusing on that. Um, but as I transition to new stuff in the summer, yeah, you can follow my adventures as I become a professor. <laughs> what is what is the new stuff? We haven't actually talked about it. You what announced it. What? What is the new thing? The new thing um, that I'm doing? Um, in August, I will be a, a physics professor at St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm teaching Astronomy 101, which I'm very excited about. Uh, they're actually bringing back the class. They haven't been able to teach it in a while. Um, and I will be teaching a course called Statics, which is kind of an engineering physics course, uh, which is very important for secondary education majors who want to go on to teach high school physics. Um, and I'll be working on some collaborations between the physics and the education departments, uh, particularly in physics education, as well as, you know, doing general astronomy stuff. Um, they just started a physics and astronomy club this semester, the students have, and so I'm hoping to, like, join in on their fun and, yeah, do all kinds of stuff there. Um, this semester I've been working with Teen Science Cafe, which is uh, bring scientist speakers to talk to uh, teens in very, in, they've got very, this is going on in various cities. I've been working with the St. Louis Node. Um, lots of, lots of different science education type projects. And then, you know, being on the job market, which sucked up a month of my life. <laughs> so... That is, that's, that is well, um, that's really great. I mean, you know, you got some great experience working with Pamela in Edwardsville, and now you're going to be your own legit physics professor. This is this is so weird. Awesome. <laughs> so weird. And I'm moving back to the East Coast. <laughs> fun. So that's where I'm from. Yeah. And awkward frozen. <laughs> Wouldn't be a hangout if we didn't lose Fraser uh, one more time. Uh, Morgan, we're we'll find no more. Well, in one hour, you can find me right back here on uh, the Hangout-a-thon, which I'm dreading every time you drop out. Uh, on Tuesday, you can find me at Astronomy on Tap uh, down in Denver. So if you're in the Denver area, come 
uh, see me drink some beer and uh, ramble on about astronomy. And of course, as always, you can find me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or at my website, morganrenberg.com. I'm wondering I if a, I want to reboot everything. Can I give a, can I give a, a brief tattoo update? Uh, Paul Stewart came up with a very good uh, suggestion, and that is uh, Flocculent Galaxy. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Flocculent might get a lot of votes in that. <laughs> uh, so I'll have to pick a particularly pretty Flocculent Galaxy to get tattooed on me. That, that would be great. Yeah, so, so far I've got Alma, the VLA and D configuration, Cassiopeia, the constellation on my back, and a Flocculent Galaxy. So those are the current, uh, those are the current suggestions. The galaxy arms, and then you can do your Flocculent Galaxy, and then boom. I don't think I can afford that, but that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, or withstand the pain. Anyway. That too. Kind of a wuss. All right, maybe I should let you guys uh, reboot and retech and do your thing. <laughs> yeah, boy, this is going to be, uh, I don't know, Hannah, can you hear us? Welcome, Hannah. I can, hello. Maybe it's not me, maybe it's you guys. All right, I'm leaving. Me and Macy are going. Okay. Macy, say goodbye. Macy, there's my dog. Yay. Hi, dog. <laughs> Bye. Ooh. See you later, Nancy. <laughs>